Thank you, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I'm next. So the title of my talk is Chips and Beer, Using Machine Learning to Optimize Inventory. I've already been asked a couple of times if I'm going to be handing out actual beer, and the answer is no. But we gave you beer at the reception last night, so and there's chips out there. So anyway, all right. Um, so I'm a professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department here at Lehigh and director of iDisk, and you already probably know that. So. Um, I want to talk about two different projects today, both involving machine learning and both involving inventory optimization. The first one uses deep learning for a news vendor type problem. It shares a lot of similarities with like the stuff that, um, that uh, Richard's group has been working on and that Richard talked about yesterday. And the second talk is about using deep reinforcement learning for dynamic inventory optimization, which shares a lot of similarities with the stuff that Joran talked about yesterday. So this is joint work with Afshin and Reza and Martin. Martin showed you probably these same pictures of Afshin and Reza earlier. Afshin and Reza were PhD students who were working with both of us. Um, I should say that I know really very, very little about machine learning. And so Martin and I have been collaborating. And um, Martin brings the machine learning stuff to the table. And I bring the supply stuff to the table. And our students have been really amazing and sort of learning both, both disciplines and doing really great interdisciplinary work. Um, and in addition to these folks, um, the, the beer game part of this talk involves a lot of work that went on at what used to be OpEx Analytics and then became LlamaSoft and then became Coupa. That's where Mike Watson works. Um, and Mike and other folks at OpEx and I collaborated to create like a, a computerized version of the beer game, which I'll show you in a little bit. And that, that figures in with, um, with some of the research as well. So um, we've presented some of this before. Mike and I presented at the Informs Analytics Conference in 2019. And I couldn't make it, not because of the pandemic, but because of um, flight delays and weather and things like that. And I just wanted to show this picture because it just makes you know that we were doing hybrid presentations before it was cool to do hybrid presentations. Um, but, you know, there's Mike and there's me. So, okay. Um, so the first topic is on deep learning for, for the news vendor type problems. The example that we made up for this is called Super Krispies. These are the chips. Um, and just like we've heard at, in other talks um, yesterday and today, we're imagining that the demand for Super Krispies depends on various features, like maybe the day of the week or the weather or whether there's an upcoming promotion or, or an upcoming holiday and so on. Um, and this is an inventory problem. We don't want to have too much Super Krispies because there's a holding cost and we don't want to have too little Super Krispies because there's a stock out cost or a, you know, a hit to our service level. And so the question is, how many cases should we have on hand today? So we're interested in the feature-driven aspect of this problem. We call it the multi-feature news vendor problem. Um, and the idea is that we have historical data on lots of features and demands. Like we've, again, heard about many times during, the, during this workshop, we have some vector of features that describe the day of the week and whether there's an upcoming holiday, et cetera. And then for that vector, we have one demand. We observed the demand on that day, and we have lots and lots of records like that. We also know the holding and stock out costs. Um, and we have multiple periods, but they're all independent from each other. It's a, like a news vendor type setup where we can't hold inventory from one time period to another and we can't hold back orders from one time period to another. So it's like multiple copies of a single period problem. And there's only one decision variable. It's the order quantity. We want to decide how much to order. And so, of course, the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, we should, use, we should use machine learning for this. We have features and we have uncertainty and we should use mach machine learning. So, you know, we started this project uh, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so. And at the time, we, there, there was not a lot of um, coalescence around ideas involving machine learning and supply chain. There were tons and tons of people saying, we're doing machine learning for supply chain, we're doing machine learning for supply chain, both in industry and in academia. And when we really looked more closely, it was almost always using machine learning for forecasting and not using machine learning directly for making decisions, which is part of what motivated us to, to theme the work, this workshop the way we did. But in any case, um, let me talk about that sort of um, 
first pass way of using machine learning to address this problem. So you've seen pictures like this many times of these deep learning networks. I like to put colors on the nodes to indicate you know, the, the value of the, um, of the variable at that node, the value of the signal at that node. And the idea is that you have some inputs that are the features, day of the week, temperature, what the stock market is doing, et cetera. And you had this on a particular day and you know what the demand was on that day. And so you're training a model to forecast the demand. So you're training it to find different values of, these, of the weights on these edges. Those are our decision variables when we're training and I'm marking those by heavier or lighter lines. Um, and we're trying to train the model in order to do a good job of predicting the demand. We want a trained neural network that can accurate, that can you know, minimize the distance between the predicted demand and the true demand. Okay? So we do this for March 28th, and then we do it for a different day. And on this day, you know, the features, oops, sorry. On this day, the features look different, and the demands look different, and we only sold two cases of Super Krispies, and then on some other day, the demands look different again, and the, the, or the features look different again, and the demands look different, and so on. And so the typical way of training this, and I'm, I'm simplifying here, but the typical way of training a model is, you know, you have different sets of weights. Those should kind of look like there's different, different levels of heaviness of the lines, but it doesn't quite come across. And for each possible set of weights, you say, okay, well, on, on March 28th, I had a certain actual demand. It was this. And using these weights, the predicted demand was 4.3. And using these weights, oh, excuse me, not the de predicted demand, the, the difference between the, the weight, the prediction and the actual. And with these weights, I had a worse difference between the predicted and the actual and so on. And of course, there's not just four possible sets of weights. There's a huge number of sets of weights. But our job is to pick the one that's best. And so we do that for one day in the training data and another day in the training data. And we add it all up. And we're trying to basically minimize that curve. Yeah, Ajo. Are you about inventory So far, we're not taking inventory into account at all. Yes. Yes. So the question was, if, since I'm only looking at historical data, basically the demand data is censored, right? We only know how many we sold. We don't know the actual demand. That's probably true, but let's even pretend a, a, a best case scenario where we know the real demand, okay? Um, and so, yeah, we're in this sort of first pass way of doing it. We're just trying to train a model to predict that demand, all right? And this is what we call the estimate as solution approach, the EAS approach, is basically you, you forecast the demand in each cluster. And a cluster is just a group of all, day, all the days that looked like a certain set of features. So all Tuesdays when it was rainy and there was no upcoming holiday or whatever. And within that cluster, you have a handful of observations. And you're trying to forecast the demand for new observations in that cluster. And then you just set the order quantity equal to the forecast. So if the model says the demand is going to be 40, you just order 40. And um, this is not really what we should be doing. I mean, as, as inventory optimizers, we, we know that that misses sort of the whole point of the news vendor problem, which is that it costs a different amount to be wrong in one direction versus the other. And so what we actually want to do is say, all right, well, we have a certain, certain range of demand values, and they have some certain probability distribution on it. And the classical news vendor approach is that you choose an order quantity that sets this balance just right. So to the left of your order quantity, you have a certain, um, you have a certain holding cost because the, your demand was smaller than your order quantity. And to the right of your order quantity, you have a stock out cost because your demand was bigger than your order quantity. And for each possible order quantity that you could choose, that results in some expected cost. And that cost is a convex function, and we just want to minimize it. So if we knew the demand distribution, this is a well-known problem, of course. But we don't know the demand distribution. And um, by doing the estimate as solution approach, we're, we're ignoring all of this logic. We're ignoring the holding versus stock out cost and just you know, going with the forecast as a point forecast. That's our order quantity. So then a slightly more sophisticated thing you could do is instead use machine learning or some other method, whatever method you like, to try to estimate this probability distribution. 
and then that results in an estimated cost function, and then we can just optimize that cost function. So this is the sort of sep what, what we call the separated estima estimation and optimization approach. It's also been called in many other papers like forecast then optimize or predict then optimize. That's what we're saying here is like you just use machine learning to get a forecast and then you kind of use classical methods to do the optimization part. Um, and this, this seems better anyway than just using the point forecast, but we suspected that there was still more that, that we could do. Um, so there are lots of other approaches in the literature. You've heard of some of them at this workshop. Um, this first estimate as solution approach, I want to mention again just because, I mean, I don't think there are really papers that say, oops, sorry, I don't think there are really papers that say, this is how you should do it. But there are still lots of papers that just kind of use that approach, you know, usually in the context of something else without really thinking too carefully, I think, about why that approach is, is not the best one. But you see it a lot, and it's also, I think, very common in practice. And the idea, this little diagram is showing, okay, we have all these different clusters, and for each cluster, we just calculate a mean, and then we set the order quantity equal to the mean. That's it. Um, then there's the separated estima estimation and optimization, also known as predict then optimize. And here, the idea is that maybe for a given cluster, you're trying to forecast the mean and standard deviation, and then you basically fit a distribution to it, let's say a normal distribution, and you solve a news vendor problem to get Q star. Um, and as, as Max pointed out this morning, as Martin pointed out, you're, you're sort of compounding multiple errors. You have an error from estimating your data, you have an error from maybe not optimizing perfectly and other forms of error as well. And so um, this is also feels like a not super satisfactory approach. So there, there have been others too. There's um, a pretty big literature on data-driven news vendor type problems. There's a paper by Bertsimus and Tila that kind of tries to estimate a quantile since in news vendor what you're essentially calculating as a quantile. There's this approach that was cited earlier by Bertsimus and Callis that uses a couple different sorts of um, standard machine learning techniques and then applies them to this problem. Um, they're probably the closest paper to ours is by Ban and Rudin from 2018, where they assume that the optimal order quantity is a linear function of the features. So as though, you know, like imagine a regression that says, um, the best order quantity today is like this coefficient times whether it's raining and this plus this coefficient times the temperature or whatever. They imagine that it's a linear um, function and then um, they use nonlinear nonlinear programming, nonlinear optimization to fit those weights. Um, they also have another method called kernel regression I won't go into, and there's lots of others, including, including the work by, by Richard and his group, and including the work by Max and his group, which I didn't even cite here, and, um, and there's lots. And in many ways, I'm not trying to argue that ours is the best. I mean, I couldn't even argue that ours is the best, because yesterday Richard showed that slide where ours was <laughs> down at the bottom. But anyway, I mean, really, we were just thinking of this as a proof of concept and as a way of trying to see how, how we could adapt machine learning methods to solve this problem. So here's how our approach works. We assume, similar to Ban and Rudin, that the optimal order quantity is a function of the features, but we don't assume it's a linear function anymore, and instead we use deep neural networks to try to estimate that function. And the, the key sort of insight here is to use, instead of using a classical kind of loss function where you're trying to measure the distance between a forecast and an actual, we're using the news vendor cost function essentially as our loss function. So this obtains the news vendor minimizer, the optimal solution directly. We're not doing sequential estimation and optimization. It's one step instead of two. And you know, and I think important thing to think of here is that there's no labels. This is not, I mean, I don't even know if I should say it's not a supervised method, but it's not, there are no labels. There's no correct values. There's only values that we could have used for the order quantity and the cost that would have resulted. And then we're trying to optimize that. Um, and we found in our experiments that this approach is effect more effective than the other approaches we tested, especially when there's not very much historical data, 
the probability distribution is unknown and or the historical data are, are messy and volatile and not coming from like a well-known distribution, for example. So the, the picture now is that we still have a neural network that looks like this. It still has for each day what are the features as the inputs, but then the output instead of a forecast is the inventory level that the neural network thinks we should use. And we train that on multiple days, and our goal is to now reduce not the difference between the forecast and the actual, but just reduce the cost, you know, keep, minimize the cost, and pick the set of weights that gives you the best cost. Um, I guess maybe I won't go too much into detail about how these features work, but I, I will say that our loss function is this. So, so we have a bunch of um, observations, and for each observation, we have a decision, a, an order quantity. Think of this y like, like q, the order quantity. And we have our demand. And if the order is bigger than the demand, then we pay a holding cost. And if the order is, big, is smaller than the demand, we pay a stock out cost, classical news vendor function. And we add that up over all the observations, and we try to minimize that. Um, I'll point out just to kind of keep the context in mind here that if we were doing estimate as solution, if we were just trying to minimize the distance between the order, the um, uh, uh, predicted value and the actual value, then we would have just sort of like a distance between those two here. But instead, we're weighting the errors too big versus errors too small, weighting them differently based on holding and stock out cost coefficients. And of course, these y's are, we can think of as the decision variables. They're the order quantities. But we don't set those directly in this scheme. We set them by adjusting the DNN network weights. And then the DNN sets the order quantity. Okay. Um, and we do some fairly standard stuff for training and, and tuning the hyperparameters. I won't go into detail. And tested it on some real-world data as well as lots and lots of synthetic data. I'll just show you a picture of the real-world data. Um, our method is this one, DNN L1. We also tested an L2 version of it, but that doesn't work as well, so I didn't talk about it. And then these are the other methods from the literature. And ours is at the bottom most of the time, except back, you know, back here a little bit. And what the x-axis is plotting is the ratio between the stock out cost and the holding cost. So what you can see, first of all, is that um, our method seems to work very well, regardless of what Richard says. And also um, that some of the other methods can, can really be quite bad, especially under certain kinds of settings. And what seems to come in second place is actually SEO, is the sequential estimation and optimization, the predict and optimize which doesn't do too badly, although we're, you know, we're 18 to 34% better than it. Um, but this is actually not as bad as we expected it to be compared to some of the other methods. Um, and also, the, the gap widens as the ratio between stock out cost and holding cost gets bigger. So in cases where you know, having a high service level is important, the, the gap among the methods can, can get bigger. Um, on the other hand, it's a machine learning model, which means that training is expensive. So for example, um, some of these other methods take tens or hundreds or thousands of seconds to train, and ours took 44,000 seconds. So it's not, this is not trivial. On the third hand, like you can do all that ahead of time, and then inference is very fast. So there's, there's all these, the usual kinds of trade-offs between in machine learning versus classical optimization methods. Um, so the summary for, for this part of the talk is that we have um, this DNN-based method that seems to outperform um, at least most of the other methods in the literature and, and, and is more stable than them in the sense that um, those, those ratios increase as the cost ratio increases. Um, and with lots of experimenting, we, we found that, for example, our method is more reliable than some of the others when the data are noisy or when there's not a lot of historical data. But, but it has to be tuned carefully. I mean. The, the, the tuning makes a big difference in terms of the performance. Um, and if there's not noisy data, but not too much of it, then we tend to, to outperform the other methods as well. 
Um, and then we also extended this to look at RQ optimization problems. So RQ is a different kind of inventory policy. And you know, um, news vendor basically amounts to choosing a quantile. And so you could argue, and some, some of the referees did, that uh, basically all we're doing is some kind of like quantile regression and that's somehow not really that interesting. And so we tested it also on the RQ optimization problem, which is not estimating a quantile in part because you now have two decision variables and the results are very similar. It works very well there too. There the, there's two output nodes from the neural network. We're choosing both decision variables and so on. Um, and you know, there aren't really good methods in the literature for the RQ problem with features. And so if you wanted to use a classical method, you have to choose a demand distribution. And because you have to choose a demand distribution, our method can usually even do better than the exact, the quote unquote exact method, because the exact method is only solving an approximate demand distribution, but then solving it exactly. Um, so by kind of working directly with the data rather than some estimate of the distribution, we're improving the accuracy. Um, our paper is in IISE transactions and there's links here and um, my student uh, has a GitHub repo where you can download the code, although it probably this, the, the DDOP is probably a much more reliable source of, of this code. Um, okay, and uh, then that's the end of the first half. Are there any questions about that before I go on? Thank you. you know, the, the graph that you showed about the performance of uh, your algorithm versus the others, uh, I think you noted that as the ratio of uh, the stock out to the holding cost increases, uh, your performance is better relative to others. Can you share any insight behind why that is the case? I'm not sure I can. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I... I, my, my instinct was to say that it would have something to do with the fact that the other methods are somehow under ordering. And so the more important, you know, the larger the stock out cost, the more under ordering is going to hurt you. But I, I don't know that that's true. And so, um, so I need to think about that more. Okay. Thanks. Thank yeah. Other questions? Okay. So the second half of the talk is about. Hey, professor. Yes. There's a uh, question. So on the Zoom, how would you get to features for something like a yeah. lipstick of a particular shade? <laughs> how do I get features for something like lipstick of a particular shade? Um, we really don't pay much attention at all to how you actually would calculate the feature values. And that's a whole, that's an important question that we really don't have a lot to add about. We're assuming like many OR or machine learning models, we're just assuming that that part of the data is given to us and we're not really, I don't have much to add about how to get those. And one more question is, can max method also be considered EAS given it estimates the solution of the problem and the realized demand only in multiple period as opposed to a news vendor? Can, can what be considered EAS? Can max method. Oh, can max's method yes. be considered like an EAS, um, I don't think it is exactly, because he's not just forecasting the demand. But I need to think about that more carefully, too. I'm really not answering your questions at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, let me move on. And if there's more questions at the end, we'll take them. Um, OK, so the second half is about deep reinforcement learning for dynamic inventory optimization. So I was going to show you this video. but you already saw it because Martin showed you. But remember that the idea here is that when DeepMind was training their reinforcement learning agent to play this Atari game breakout, it did really badly at first and with more training it did better and with more training it did better and eventually it learned this like, you know, technique that I don't know, pro Atari players use, which is you build that little channel up the sides and you let the ball bounce around at the top. But you already saw that and so I, I, won't, um, I won't make you watch it again. Um, these deep learning algorithms also learn to exploit parts of the game. I stole this slide from Mike. I hope you don't have it in your presentation, but anyway, um, where basically the AI found a bug in this old GameCube. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit incensed about the word archaic here. 
um, referring to Qbert because <laughs> I remember Qbert. But anyway, um, it found a bug in Qbert that let it basically just get infinite infinite scores by exploiting some little bug or something like that. And of course, of course, there's Go, and of course, there's chess. Um, but but the the thing I especially want to point out in in like the chess example is that the AI didn't just learn to to play chess the way really good human chess players play chess. It learned to play chess in different ways in some cases. And human chess experts are learning new chess ideas and chess techniques by studying how AlphaGo plays chess. And that seems like a really interesting and and an exciting idea that like machine learning algorithms might be finding things that we that are better than how we knew how to do things. Um, and I'll come back to that idea in a bit. So, you know, um, Afshin and Reza and Martin and I had, of course, read the papers on AlphaGo and, and AlphaZero and all that. And I said to Afshin and Reza at one point, like, well, we have, we have a game in supply chain. It's called the beer game. Why don't you see if you can apply those ideas to, to the supply chain version of the game? And I mean, I, I thought it would be simple and a cute little exercise and it would take them a few weeks and, um, and we'd be done with it, but it, it did not turn out to be like that. It turned into a multi-year you know, PhD research project um, for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and it's been, it, it was a, a lot of fun to work on. And as part of that, we also partnered with OpEx to build a computerized version of the beer game. That's what you're seeing here. So the beer game, for those of you who don't, who don't know it, is a, is a game that's been played in supply chain classes for many decades. And the idea is that in, in the game, you have four players, usually called the manufacturer, the distributor, the wholesaler, and the retailer. And the retailer is selling beer to um, you know, some external customer whose demands are generated outside, exogenously outside the game. And you play the role of one of those players, and your job in every time period is just to decide how much to order. That's it. You observe the orders that you receive from your customer. Like if you're the wholesaler, then your customer is the retailer. You observe the demands from the retailers. Those are, those are your demands. And then you choose your order quantity. And that becomes the demand for your upstream partner. That's the distributor. And they observe their demands, which is, which is your orders. And they choose an order quantity. And then they send it upstream. And then the actual inventory flows downstream. And your goal in the game is to try to minimize the total cost of the supply chain, all four players, not just you. And part of what makes it so hard is that you, you don't have full information about what's happening in the supply chain. You only have information about what's happening at your node. Um, so the game is used really for a couple of reasons. One is to demonstrate that ordering inventory, managing inventory is hard. And in particular, that it's hard because of the bullwhip effect. And the bullwhip effect is a phenomenon you've probably heard of before that basically says that the volatility in order quantities increases as you move upstream. So for example, the rate of consumption of some product, like you know, the classic example is diapers, but pick whatever your favorite product is. The, the consumption is fairly steady. But then the rate, you know, the sales over time of whatever the product is, like people going to the store and buying it is more volatile. And then the retailer's orders to the wholesaler are even more volatile. And the wholesaler orders to the manufacturer are more so. And the manufacturer orders to the supplier are more so. And as you move upstream, the variability gets worse. And so the, the beer game is meant to um, demonstrate this because what tends to happen in the beer game is that you place these orders and they kind of go off into the ether and, and it because of the lead times and because of because you don't have information about what's happening elsewhere in the supply chain, um, the, the, the reaction to the actions that you t took are very delayed. So you place an order because you're running out of inventory and the order doesn't come next period. So you panic a little and you order a little more and then the order still doesn't come and you panic even more and you place a bigger order and a bigger order and then suddenly these huge orders start arriving so then you like slam on the brakes and you don't order at all but then you run out of it. so so there's this like swinging back and forth and that's where the bullwhip effect comes from in the beer game so 
there's really two goals in the beer game. One is the player's goal. Like when I teach the beer game, I say, okay, you guys, your goal is to minimize inventory costs, minimize holding and stock out costs. But that's actually different from my goal. My goal is to demonstrate the bullwhip effect because I know that at the end of the game, there's gonna be data that's gonna show that you guys made the bullwhip effect happen. And almost all of the literature in the beer game is about the second goal. It's about modeling how people play the game or, or you know, how do people's behaviors change when different settings in the game change and so on. But what we're interested in is the first goal. We're interested in asking like, what, what, how, what's the optimal way to play the game? And there are certain conditions under which the theory tells us what the optimal way to play is. And there are certain conditions under which the theory does not tell us. And especially for the second case, we wanted to see if we can use machine learning to, to make good decisions in that setting. Um, so as I said, there's lots of literature about the beer game. It was first developed in the 50s and 60s. The, the kind of key paper here is by Sturman in 1989. What, what he, in addition to being the one that's, that like published the rules and said, here's how to play the beer game, he proposed a model of human behavior. So as I said, humans don't play the beer game rationally. They do this sort of panicky ordering and so on. And Sturman built a model of that. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead. So his model said, all right, the order quantity that a human player chooses is related to the what they think the demand is gonna be. That's the kind of rational thing to do. But then the human says, okay, I have this number in my mind, A, and I want my inventory level always to be A. And if my inventory level is different from A, then I'm gonna adjust my order quantity higher or lower to, just because I'm a little bit panicked. And similarly, I have, I have a, a number that I want my pipeline inventory, my on order inventory to be. And if that is too high or too low, I'm gonna adjust my order quantity. And not adjust my order quantity in a sort of optimal way, but just sort of knee jerk panicking reaction. And so this is not meant to be a model of how you should order, this is a model of how humans order and in the beer game. And Sturman did experiments and subsequent authors have too to try to like calibrate these, these parameters and get a good model for, for how humans behave. Okay, so our beer game reinforcement learning agent, here's our standard kind of diagram with, with some of the details filled in. We have our agent, we have an environment that it interacts with. The only action that our agent can take is to choose an order quantity, just like your only goal, your, your only action when you play the beer game is to choose an order quantity. That order quantity goes out into the world. It interacts with the environment. Um, you have a new state. Your state is defined by your inventory level, as well as certain other things in our, that I didn't picture here, like the on order inventory and your back orders and things like that. Um, and so your state updates because the environment, let's say, delivers some beer to you. And then you get a reward, and your reward is basically your cost for having inventory on hand or for having stockouts in that time period. Um, but there turned out, it turns out that there are big differences between the beer game and the other games that people talk about in the context of reinforcement learning, like chess and Atari and so on. So all of these games, chess and Atari and Go, are competitive, but the beer game is cooperative. You're playing on a team and you're trying to optimize your team's performance. I mean, yes, you're competing maybe against other teams, but that's irrelevant from the perspective of what you're doing on your, in the game. You're always trying to minimize your cost. The fact that other people in the room are also trying to minimize their cost doesn't change your behavior. So it's a competitive game, a, a cooperative game instead of a competitive game. These games are all zero sum games. If I win, you lose. Or if I earn points in Atari, then my opponent, the space invaders or whatever, lose points effectively. Whereas um, the beer game is not a zero sum game. In these games, we have full information. We don't have information about what's gonna happen next because there's randomness and because our opponent might act in ways we can't predict. But we have full information about the state of the game. We don't have that information in the beer game because we only know our our own information. We don't know the other people in the supply chain. 
And in these other games, at least in Atari games, not in chess and go, but in Atari games, we get a reward signal instantly. We always know what our score is. In chess and go, we don't know what our score is really until the end of the game when we find out if we won or lost. And similarly, in the beer game, the reward signal is delayed. I know my own costs, but I don't know the cost of the whole supply chain because I don't know what's happening elsewhere in the supply chain. So all of these things conspired to make, the, make it much harder than I expected originally to build an RL agent to play the beer game. But we eventually did. We did something that, you know, we built something that, that is, performs at least reasonably well. Um, and in addition to drawing a contrast between, um, between the beer game and Atari versus chess, I also want to think about the contrast between reinforcement learning as a tool for solving inventory problems versus the classical methods like the kind in Max's in my book. So for example, you know, the typical way to learn and, and teach inventory models uses stationary parameters. You just know what mu and sigma are and it's the same forever. Whereas inventory um, in real life is usually dynamic and those parameters are changing and that makes it maybe a better kind of situation to try out our uh, reinforcement learning. In classical models, we assume we know the probability distributions. In real life, we do not. And that's also a, a, a something that RL can often be useful for. Um, with classical models, it can be really hard to generate new constraints or different objectives because we're trying to solve these models analytically or maybe with some optimization algorithms. And if we make some new assumption and it breaks the convexity or it breaks our ability to solve things in closed form, then all bets are maybe off. Whereas RL can be much more flexible. Analytical solutions versus numerical solutions, basically the same thing. And of course, in classical models, we don't need to train anything. We just get solutions, whereas inventory reinforcement learning, we need, to, we need to train the models. So reinforcement learning can work very well when we have a model of the environment, even if we can't optimize the environment analytically. And that's, that's the sort of space that we're playing in. Of course, we also need to be able to simulate the environment and train the, tra train the model. And again, that can be very, very slow. Our reinforcement learning agent took thousands of hours of CPU time to train, or maybe GPU time, actually, I'm not sure. Um, our training data are all simulated, but then of course, once it's trained, the model can recommend inventory levels, can optimize inventory levels in real time. Okay, so now I have another video that I'm pretty sure you haven't seen. This is the reinforcement learning agent playing the OpEx beer game, and I'll, I'll just speed it up a little bit because it's a little slow. Okay, so this is just the basics of, of the beer game. There's four players, and they're trying to manage, manage their inventory. I already told you all that, and we built a, an RL. So although the pictures I've showed you had, had the, the player being here at the wholesaler, in the results I'll show you here, they're up at the wholesaler. So here's how our agent learned to play. Feels like the same plot as the Atari video, and it is. So at first, like before the agent is trained at all, the inventory levels are erratic. They're too low, meaning stockouts um, at, at these sort of middle nodes. Then they're too high, not maybe super high, but a little bit high. They're just kind of fluctuating all over the place. And this is before the thing has been trained at all. Then we play the game a thousand times. And the agent eventually learns that it needs inventory here. It should not run out of inventory, but it holds way too much, just hundreds and hundreds of cases of beer when we only need, you know, 10-ish. Then it trains some more, and it learns that what we really care about is inventory at the retailer. That's where, th that's where it, co it comes down to. If there's stockouts there, that's going to cause a problem everywhere. And so it learns to kind of keep the inventory okay here, but the inventory levels upstream are again fluctuating a lot. And then finally, after lots and lots of play, it learns to keep a good amount of inventory at the retailer while also running more sort of lean upstream, not too much inventory, once in a while a stock out or two, but not too, too much. Um, and so that, that was really interesting. And in many ways, like the whole, my whole goal when I asked Mike if OpEx wanted to build um, a beer game was so that I could make that video, and now, <laughs> now I have, so I'm happy about that. Um, but but what, I'm re what really turned out to interest me more at the end of this project is, is how the RL agent learned to optimize inventory. So 
When the RL is here at the wholesaler and the other players, so in the OPEX version of the beer game, all the other three players are computerized. You, you can't play with four humans. So if the other three players, the computerized players, are playing as what we call rational players, or what that means is that they're following a base stock policy. It is optimal for all the players to follow a base stock policy in the beer game, but they don't. But if they did, it's all, then it's also optimal for us to follow a base stock policy. This blue line is the cost for the base stock policy, and these lines are like the training curves for the RL. And what you can see is that at least for some settings of the learning rate or something, the RL learns to do something that's pretty close to the optimal policy, pretty, like within about 5% of the optimal policy, which is a uh, base stock policy. But to me, what's even more interesting is that if the other players are following what in the game is called a human-like player, but it's really that Sturman formula that I told you about that tries to mimic how humans play. If the other agents are playing something irrational, then we no longer know, we meaning inventory theorists, no longer know what's optimal to do here. If your partners are doing something crazy, there's not really any literature about what you should do. And um, the best guess is like, okay, well, I'll just use a base stock policy because that's what we know how to do. And so we did that. We found the best possible base stock policy. That best possible base stock policy is this blue line, but the RL learned to do something better. Which, which means that a base stock policy is not optimal here, which I think was not really known before. I mean, it's not a proof, but it's a numerical suggestion that that's the case. And we really don't know what the RL is doing. And this is where I draw inspiration from the chess example. Like, I would really like to learn about inventory optimization from what the RL decided to do here, just like human chess players are learning how to play chess from, from AlphaGo. And we really don't know. One of my students, Kanya, is working now on a project to try to figure out, like, what is the optimal policy and see if we can compare that to what the RL did. But it's, it's actually really hard to optimize the inventory here when you don't have a good understanding of what the, what the other players are doing. Um, okay, so uh, I'll wrap up quickly. The OPEX slash Lamasoft slash Koopa beer game is online and free, and there's a link to it. Um, I've used it many times as a teaching tool. I think it works really well. The downside is you can't play four humans on a team, but you can set the other three players to this human-like and it works really reliably at demonstrate at, at creating the bullwhip effect. So then the next day in class, you can talk about, look, you guys made the bullwhip effect happen. Um, and it, it works really well. Yes? OK. It's owned by Koopa, and it might disappear. So get your beer game now while it's still there. Um, our paper is uh, forthcoming in MSOM. We have a, a blog post Mike and I wrote a little while ago about it. And we have some open source code here as well. OK, I'll stop there. Questions? Thank you. Just got the mic. Um, did you have a look into whether the RL agent maybe have, has learned some kind of also crazy policy that m mimics kind of this human behavior, but maybe in a different direction? So basically decomposing the policy of the RA, RL agent into these kind of parameters by Sturman, which was kind of inventory level, on order level, etc. I don't think the RL is doing something Sturman-like, because it's not optimal to do something yeah. Sturman-like. He was just trying to say how humans actually behave, not what we should do. It could be that that's close to optimal, but I don't think so. Um, but. I mean, the bigger question that you're asking is, did we try to figure out what it is actually doing? And we did, and we can't really figure it out. It's hard, you know, it's this question of interpretability. It's hard to understand, like, we know what it did in a given time period when the state was this state and when the, you know, but we, do, we knew what action it took, but we, it's hard to draw patterns from that. But that's what we're trying to figure out. But, but Larry, just so that I don't understand, don't you just think it is learning the irrational behavior of the other agents? Yeah, but That's I mean... That's what Felix was saying. Right. So if you, if you simulate this somehow through a formula, um, the reinforcement learning agent 
knows what is going to happen and, and builds a policy on this, right? Which is not the base stock policy. Right. I for sure think that it's learning what the other players are doing. But if the question is like, what is it doing? I don't think what it's doing is like mimicking what, what these players are doing. Because it shouldn't. It should do something different. Uh, yeah, okay. It's so exploiting some kind of, somehow. It's exploiting, exploiting it, right. Yeah. But I mean, what does that mean? It's turning it upside down or something. I mean, yeah, maybe something like that. But I would love to be able to say, like, in this situation, the optimal form of the policy is this. Like, if the inventory level is below this point, you order here, you know, the kind of stuff we always do. Um, but it's really hard. It's, I'm sure, state dependent. You know, maybe we can come up with heuristics or something and hopefully use some of these results as an inspiration. But we're interested now in like the inventory theoretic way of looking at it and saying, how do you optimize when the other players do that? Uh, since the mic is there, yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious the, the reward framework again, what was it? Was it quantified? Like, what was the quantities assigned so, in terms of? Like so the, the reward game. is just the negative of the cost. I mean, the, the cost that the beer game players incur, holding and stock out costs. The reward is, is the negative of that. But the tricky thing is you don't really learn that cost until the end of the game. So there's a kind of reward shaping mechanism to distribute that back in time or, or something. I don't remember the details of that. But Sorry. So I'm wondering if you ever ran it with a RL at each node, and does it converge to a base stock? Yeah. Or does it struggle to do that? We, we, we tried running multiple RLs like at each stage, and it, as I recall, it was just too intensive to even train it, and we kind of gave up. But that's a, definitely an important direction that I, I think we want to go. Yeah. Okay. Do you... Uh, the question okay, is, one more one question from online, and then then we'll let Mike go. Okay, so what is your view on the applicability of this reinforcement learning approach for more complex supply chain settings and problems with increasing state and action space? And do you think the applicability could be improved by using other reinforcement learning ingredients, uh, for example, on policy learning? Yes. Okay. So. Um, I, I feel like I, ch I change my mind about that question every day almost. Like sometimes I feel very optimistic that this kind of approach or the kinds of approaches that many people in this workshop have talked about um, are, event are building blocks to something that'll be much, much more flexible and can solve multiple nodes at once and all kinds of different cost structures and weird randomness and all that sort of thing. And that eventually all of that can go into one model and good results will come out. And then other days I feel like it's just still too hard and too problem dependent and you know this even though this is a little bit more complicated than news vendor it's still a pretty self-contained set of rules and costs and decisions and to expand that into like a real supply chain is it's definitely a research question it's not like something that we could just take this and now apply it to a real setting immediately um, and I definitely think there's lots of potential but how quickly and how far I, I don't know. All right. Thank you. <laughs>